Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about another optimization technique in revenue management called choice modeling, often called customer choice modeling or consumer choice modeling. More generally, it's discrete choice modeling. This is a very interesting approach that gets a lot of research attention in revenue management, but there are not many practical applications, at least that I know of. And the reason is it's quite difficult to do. The math and the estimation is quite difficult. I'm going to talk about why that is, but I'm going to skip all of the math in this video. And the reason is, well, two things. One, it's a lot, and we'll just leave that to more qualified people. If you're interested in learning that, there are several really great papers. Um, and if anybody wants some references, I'd be glad to give you them. Um, and also, I think it's, it's helpful once in a while for operations research people, for mathematicians, to forget the math once in a while and really focus on what we're trying to do. When we build a model, the reason we build a model is we're trying to build something that represents real-world behavior. And if we can build an accurate model, then we can use that model to make good business choices or good uh, uh, pricing choices so that in, in the case of revenue management, we can maximize revenue. So I want to talk about why choice modeling is appealing, at least for me, why it might be better some, than some other techniques, and what the, the practical challenges of actually using choice modeling are. So let's start by thinking about the other models we have reviewed and think about what deficiencies might exist that would lead us to investigate alternative models like choice modeling. We have looked at Littlewood's rule, EMSR, EMSRA, EMSRB, the bid price methods, linear programming, nonlinear programming. And if you have viewed those videos, I think you would agree that there are many appealing attributes of those models that would lead us to have confidence that they would do a good job at maximizing revenue. And indeed, the airline industry has been using those models for many years. So why are we looking, or why, why do we think there's a better approach uh, than the tried and true methods that uh, have been so successful in the past? Well, the one assumption common to all of the techniques that I mentioned is independence of demand. So let me write that down here. Indepen Oops, I was going to use a different color there. Let me just do this. Independence of demand. Independence. And this is really an important assumption. Independence. What that means is our model of customer behavior is making an assumption that is really not valid. So for example, what does this mean? Let's say there is a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, to Los Angeles, California, and the current selling price is $217. When we run our forecasting methods in our optimization algorithms, such as EMSR, we assume that there is a customer out there who wants to fly from Charlotte to LAX on this flight, whatever time this flight departs, on this airline, and we try to determine the probability that that customer will pay us $217. Remember, we calculate that expected value. We make a forecast, we estimate a probability distribution, and from that distribution, we get a probability that this customer will pay us $217. We multiply that probability times that fare. That's our expected value. We feed that into our algorithm, and we decide how many seats we're going to allocate to that fare. Well, in reality, people don't shop that way right? If there's a customer who is looking to go from Charlotte to, to uh, Los Angeles, they're not just thinking about a particular fare, often not a particular airline or even a particular time of day or a particular day. They're interested in many attributes. Uh, is it nonstop? Is it a connecting flight? Is it on their favorite airline? So here are the search results from an online travel agency. And this is probably more typical, not probably, this is more typical of how customers shop. They might go right to an airline site, they might call a travel agency, but certainly in the U.S., 
online travel agencies are where the majority of people shop for flights. So they're not just thinking there's a flight, you know, one flight at $217, will I take that flight or not? They probably come into the site thinking, I need to go from Charlotte to Los Angeles on June 11th, and I want to see what the options are. So this screen is sorted in order of price. So the customer might say, wow, $217, that's a good price. Uh, but it's at 8.15 in the morning. I want to leave in the afternoon. Uh, they might come down and say, uh, let's see, where's a higher price? Here's one at 7 a.m. on Delta, still too early, and it goes through Atlanta. Uh, maybe they don't want to go through Atlanta. Here's another Delta flight. This one goes through Detroit. It's one stop. They're getting more expensive. Let's go further down. Uh, here, maybe the 230 flight is more appealing, but it's, it's a higher price. Uh, if you come down further, you find some non-stops, I believe. So here are the non-stops. Certainly customers prefer non-stops instead of connections, but it's a lot more money. Uh, so customers are, I think, if, you know, we can all relate to this, right? We don't have one, one criteria in mind. We're making trade-offs. We have favorite airlines. We have brand preferences. We have time of day preferences. I, if I'm very price sensitive, I might say, well, I'd really rather go in the afternoon, but for $217, I'll get up early. Or I might be a business customer that my, co my uh, company's paying for it, and I'm going to fly nonstop at the time I need to go, and I don't care that it's a high price. What choice modeling does, it takes into account all of these attributes, and the entire choice set that is presented to the customer at the time of shopping and then optimizes around that choice set. So it assumes that when customers shop, they are presented with a number of different choices. It eliminates that assumption of independence. Now I'm not going to go through the math of why that makes sense, but I think you can you can think of just if you were if you were creating a model with any without any constraints of data availability or uh, uh, the mathematical traction of actually coming to us, uh, uh, you know, optimizing and, and getting to a solution, this is a much more logical approach because it's much more in line with real world behavior. So if I've convinced you that this is a more accurate way of modeling customer behavior and would lead to a better result for airlines, the next question would be, then why don't we just use customer choice models instead of the traditional models that have this assumption of independence. Well, this is where you get to the practical considerations of implementing a model like this. So let's talk about a few of those. Let me go back to my screen here. The first thing we need to consider is the availability of the data. Just like any model, the success of the model will be determined by the availability and the accuracy of the data. And when you think of the other models we're using, the data is much more in the control of the airline. So if I was using EMSR and I'm an airline, all I need is the historical bookings for my airline. Now, if you look at this shopping session, the airline would want to know the choice set of all the other airlines in the market, what they presented at the time of the shopping, and what the customer's choice was. So the first practical, practical, excuse me, the first practical consideration is the airlines don't own this data. This happens to be a particular online travel agency. There are many places where customers shop. So how do you accumulate all that data? And then there's the the sharing of the data that you know is a uh, an obstacle. Maybe maybe one airline doesn't want another airline uh, to know what their uh, choice set was, uh, for good reason. The other thing is, given all of these choice sets, it's hard to know what the customer was doing at the time that they shopped. So we have many different shopping sessions. Some of those sessions result in a purchase, some of them don't. What do you do with the sessions that don't result in a purchase? Does that mean the customer came to the session, didn't see anything that met their needs, and chose not to purchase? 
Or were they just shopping and they've been, you know, on three different sites and ultimately they were going to purchase or they did purchase, but we just don't capture that, that uh, behavior because they're shopping in so many different places. So getting the, getting the data is number one. The next is once you have the data, let's assume that you do have great data, it's all accurate, it's clean, and now you want to estimate your parameters. So the, th the second thing that we have to consider is can we estimate these parameters? So the second thing is parameter estimation. Now, if you look in the literature, you would say, well, we know how to do this uh, estimation. Just feed the data into the model and you estimate the parameters. Well, not so fast. It's not that easy. We know that there are techniques to estimate the parameters of these models. The question is, how accurate are those estimates? And will a model with those estimates give a better result than the alternative models? Well, there's, there's two issues there. One is it's very difficult to determine how accurate those estimates are. Now, you could say, given the data, I've come up with an accurate estimate. But really, you have to go through simulations and trials and really determine, is the end result better than a result I can get from an alternative model? That's not an easy thing to do. The other thing is, even if you can prove that you've come up with accurate estimates, those parameters can change very quickly. So if you look back at our shopping session, customer preferences, um, customers' willingness to pay, the elasticity, uh, you know, elasticity of demand can change quite quickly in this environment. The way these models, these models are so data intensive that it's very hard to pick up short-term changes in parameter estimates. So there has to be some way of ensuring that the current estimates are accurate and what the shelf life of those estimates are because once they become stale they can lead to very uh, erroneous results. So that's about all I'm going to say on choice modeling. Again I'll leave the math to other sources. There are some, some great uh, papers and really smart people working on this problem uh, and you can look into that if you're interested in this area for a topic of research. I'll just conclude with my opinion on um, choice modeling for uh, in, in a practical sense and I think I said at the beginning of the video not everybody agrees that this is an approach worth pursuing because of the challenges that I've mentioned and some some other mathematical challenges. My opinion is that this is so appealing that it is worth pursuing. I think that data is becoming more and more available and, and big data and um, you know, computers are becoming faster and able to uh, estimate parameters more quickly and more often. I don't know if this will ever become a mainstream model for revenue management, but it's certainly an area that I think we have to go even if we don't uh, come up with the you know optimal choice modeling model we will learn techniques that we can apply to other areas and other models this assumption of independence that's in all of the models that we're using today is something that I think the science has to get beyond uh, and either determine that there is an alternative or or there isn't but uh, I do believe that there's enough going for this approach that it should be pursued. So if you're a researcher and you're looking for a good topic out there, uh, this is a great way, uh, place to look. Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is because of the, the way airlines are selling their product today, so much is based beyond the fare. So you know, airlines are selling a fare, then they're selling seats and bags and drinks and videos. Customer choice modeling does do a better job of incorporating all that uh, information than uh, the traditional models. So I think I'll leave it there and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.